this third and last part of our three-part series on the basic assembly line, I'm going to focus on two things. In the first part, we're just going to add some variables so that we can demonstrate how do you kind of keep track of specific values inside your uh, model. And secondly, we're going to write out some statistics to a file so that we can analyze it in R or Excel or wherever you do your statistical analysis. Up till now, we've mainly used the process modeling library. The variables are situated on our agent library, or if you don't necessarily know that, with the palette activated, you can literally just start typing in VAR for variable, and you will see that it starts a lookup automatically, and there you can actually see there is an element called a variable. So we're just going to drag a variable somewhere close to our starting position, and I'm going to call this variable VAR, I use the prefix VAR to indicate all of my variables in my model. And this one is going to be called WIP, work in process. So this is the variable that will keep track of the number of units that are currently in process, meaning they are in the system, but they have neither been shipped nor scrapped. Since we're going to deal with discrete elements, I'm going to change my type to integer and the initial value will be zero. Similarly, I'm going to add two more. And although I can see the values directly on when the model is running, I may want to actually store a specific variable for the number of units shipped, which I'm going to use the prefix VAR again and ship. Again, it will be an integer variable with initial value zero. And lastly, prefix VAR and scrap type integer initial value zero. Now at this point the variables will always stay zero unless we tell our model that it should do something with a variable. Now remember this is an entity kind of a discrete event or an entity based simulation model. So entities, as they travel through our simulation model, are the things that actually trigger the actions. So when you click on parts arriving and you expand this section, sometimes advanced or other times it is under actions, you can actually see that there are different places where you can execute specific commands. So what will happen is, just before an entity arrives, you can trigger, let that entity trigger some actions. Similarly, when the entity is at the exit port, it can trigger um, a specific action, or as soon as it leaves the source block, you can also let it trigger some actions. And that's what we want to do in this specific case. As soon as the entity leaves this source block, it means it is now in our system. At that point, we actually want to increment this variable of ours, var work in process, to indicate, hey, there's a new part that actually arrived. And there are three ways in which you can increase the value of, um, of a variable. You can actually say var control space. Control space we use for code completion because that allows us to look up the variables that are already in there. And that's why I use a prefix, because I know all my variables are uh, use a prefix VAR, and then my different variables appear immediately. In this case, I'm interested in variable work in process. So on exit, I can increment the value of var work in process in, two way, in three ways. I can either say the val new value is the value plus one, which is one way of doing it. Another way that I think is Java specific is plus equals one. That is just shorthand for add one to the current value. Or there's even a shorter ver version which we're going to use plus plus. So every time that an entity leaves the source block and it moves into our uh, model, it will increase the work in process variable. What we also want to do, as soon as an entity is shipped, 
Again, here we see that there is an area for action. As soon as an entity enters this particular block, you can also enter some code. And in this case, we want to reduce the value because that unit that is now being shipped is no longer in the system. So we want to reduce the number of units work in process. So I can start typing, control space, and use the shorthand minus minus. Again, the alternatives would be minus equals one or new value equals old value minus one. All right, but as soon as an entity is scrapped, we also need to reduce it because it's no longer in the system. So I start typing again, minus, minus. All right. So that deals with variable work in process. To deal with this variable shipped, I only want to increment this variable value every time that a unit actually enters the shipping uh, block. I already have one action here, and to add the next action, Java requires that you end a line with a semicolon. Then you can press return, and now I want to increment the value of variable ship. So as soon as an entity arrives, it will reduce the number of units that are work in process and it will increase the number of units shipped. Similarly, I'm going to increment the variable scrap as soon as an entity arrives at this block called scrap. And now you can see that I can call different variables from different places in my model using this logic. There's a really good primer on Java for any logic if you go to the help function. And I strongly recommend that if you're not that comfortable with Java that you actually look at any logic's help. All right. If I now save my model and I execute it again, Going to speed it up slightly you'll see that as soon as an entity arrives it also increases the variable work in process let's just speed it up a little bit And here you see that the variable ship and the number of units that are actually shipped do coincide. The reason why we may want to use a variable is because a variable we can address in Java code. That little blue number just indicates the number of units that have passed there. It does unfortunately not allow us to address that value specifically. Whereas a variable we can increase and use elsewhere and decrease and change its value and use it in calculations. All right, now for the second portion, which is probably a little bit more challenging. Inside this time measure in block, there are two inherent components. And to see what those components are, let me just bring the F1 help function here. I'm going to go to my library, library reference guide, process modeling, process modeling library blocks, time measure end. There is a histogram data object that is called, referred to as distribution and there is a data set object that is called the data set. And those are two elements that are inherent, inherent in this time measure end block of ours. And we may want to access that and we're going to look at two ways of doing that. Firstly, in the model, and then we, I'm going to show, but how can you actually write that out um, externally? In our analysis tab, there is a histogram that I'm going to just drag to my workspace, and I'm going to use the default name chart. If I want to add histogram data, I'm going to call this throughput oops throughput time and now i actually need to tell it what data to draw this histogram on and i'm going to call on this block 
which is called stop time in my model, I'm going to call on that block and try and get my hands on its histogram data. And it is actually quite simple. I can just start typing the block's name. That will be the object name. Stop, and when I press control space, it brings up stop time and it tells me this is a time measure end block. That's what I'm interested in. And if I want to have a look at what methods are available, I can press dot, control space, and there is the histogram smart data that I'm interested in. So that will be the distribution data, the histogram data that I would like to plot. For the rest, I'm going to leave everything as default, save the model and run it again. And initially, I'm just going to speed it up quite fast so that we can start getting units through. And as the units move through my model and they are actually packaged and shipped, which is the point where I actually measure them, you'll see that the histogram is actually updated. And the longer I run the model, the histogram will actually be populated and it will automatically adjust itself. And I can run this until 4.30 in the afternoon. If I just stop my model, it does seem, yes, that our number of time units are 32,400, which implies that our model is set up to run in seconds. Let's just check that. And that we have what seems to be a mean of about 650 odd seconds. But clearly it's not a normal distribution. It looks slightly skewed towards the right. We can check our model time by going to our project, clicking on basic assembly, and indeed the model time units are set in seconds. All right, but you may want to get your hands on that histogram data because you want to use it outside. It's one thing to look at it while your model is running, that's beautiful, but you may want to actually have the data in a text file, for example. And AnyLogic allows you some nice um, interfaces and there is an entire tab that deals with connectivity and we're going to keep it quite simple by just looking at a text file. So I'm going to drag this text file to my workspace. And I'm going to call this just output. The resource is going to be a file. I don't want to read, I actually want to write. And the difference between write and write append is that as soon as you append, you will always add to an existing file, whereas write will ensure that you overwrite a file if it already exists, which is good if you want a run not to include the data in a hundred runs, but actually have one run's data at a time. I typically use UTF-8, which probably is also my default system settings. Now I need to tell it where this file is. I can either just type the path or I suggest that you create an empty file using a text editor to just make sure that you do not have a typo in the path that you provide. I use Text Wrangler as my text editor. You can use Text Edit or Notepad or Notepad++. And I'm just going to create an empty text file, save it to some folder. Let's just call this output.txt and we can save the file. Now in our browser, we can just navigate to that file and say, there is the entire path to our AnyLogic output. Again, we've created this output, but we haven't written to this particular file. And what we want to do is as soon as an entity, every entity that arrives at stop time will already have been added to the data set. Here I'm going to show you how I will typically do it, although there may be other ways of doing this. 
I'm setting my data set capacity to 1. Meaning every entity that arrives will immediately be put into this data set of 1. I will write it out to file and then I don't care about it anymore. It doesn't have to stay inside the model. Because I will write it out immediately. And the way in which I actually write it out... Let me just expand this area a little bit because I'll need some space. I'm going to, let's just say, string, define some string of mine. Let's just call it S. And this string is going to be stop time. I'm interested in the data set. And you will see that I can get the X and I can also get the Y. Now, I know from experience that the X is the actual time, kind of the time stamp when the entry is made and the Y is the actual value. And I'm looking for a specific one. And the one is index zero because Java uses zero as um, the first index which will give me the timestamp of this entity that has just been put into the only available position in my data set. So if I take the first one, which is the only one, it will give me the actual timestamp that this entity has just entered here. Next, I want to add to the string a comma, and then I'm going to get the Y value. And you can read more about how the time measure end object works in the F1 help file. The Y value will be the time measured since the same entity left the start time block, which will give me, in this case, the Y value, the total time that this entity has spent in the system, which is what I want. I want to see how long these entities have actually taken um, inside my little assembly line. So this is the first line. This will convert it to a string and the string will be called S. And next I want to write the string out to my output file. So I'm going to call my output text file. And there is a print line function that allows me to send a string to it. The nice thing about a print line is at the end of this line, it will actually provide with a new line character. So I don't have to issue that manually. And in this case, it should just print the string of mine S. I can save my model. And I can run it. If I run this, it should write 3,280 lines of output to this text file called output.txt. But I will likely not see anything in the output file until I actually stop this model. So if I now go back and I open this file, You will see that the first column is quite detailed, but they are chronologically because those are the actual time stamps when the entity arrived. And this may be useful to actually see at what time of day something specific happened. And my second column, there's no, there are no headers in this file. The second column is actually the throughput time for that particular element. And now you've written out your output to a text file. So we can open up something like our studio. And I'm going to read in my data. Print 
providing the option header is false. And if I look at my environment, indeed, I see a variable called D with data frame with two variables with 3,280 observations. In this case, it's simply called variable one and variable two. And if I want to draw a histogram, it is as simple as histogram D variable two. And here I can actually see a similar histogram. Again, if I want to add a little bit more detail, I can say breaks from zero to 2000 in steps of say 20. But I only want to plot from 400 to 1200. I want to give the X label throughput time in seconds. Oops, typo. And there is the new histogram created for me. If I want to add the mean as well, I can simply provide an ab line. <coughs> And it shows me where the mean value is. From here on, it would actually be good to see what the difference between two runs might be. So you'll have to set up different experiments that you can compare these means and the tightness of the distribution with one another. And that is how you get your hands on the variables. Mm -hmm.